God is so good to me every day. I miss Wednesday night, and I, I really did. I missed it. I wished I could have been here, but uh, at my age of 70, almost six, 70, almost seven, 77. Uh, all of the <laughs> I had a week from hell about a week ago. <laughs> I drove this truck, and of course, I'm a truck driver. I can semi all the way down to a scooter. And, uh, but anyway, the truck, I mean, it just wore me out. It was too hot, hot. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, hot. But I'm all right now. <clears throat> the only holdover is my, uh, my throat's a little uh, weak. My, I, I was holding a revival meeting in Philadelphia at the uh, Metropolitan Opera House, and uh, my son Rick was there with me. And I, I got uh, I, this hay fever so bad, and uh, I, I couldn't, my nose would just keep on, you, anybody ever have that? Itching, sneezing, nose running, and everything else. Well, that's what I had, and it's <laughs> so I I just called my associate minister. Uh, anybody remember Brother Boney <laughs> or Reverend Bonet? <laughs> uh, he he changed his name to Bonet after Lisa Bonet, and uh, but it was Boney up until that time, which is good. That was a good change, <laughs> and. Uh, I, I called him, and I said, I'm, Boney, I'm going to let you go ahead and preach tonight. He said, okay. And my son was standing back at the entrance to the place, and a lady walked in and said, is the healer here tonight? And my, said, my son said, no, he's sick at home. <laughs> yeah, he did. But God is certainly a good God. <laughs> no, the healer is sick. He won't be here tonight. Amen. But God certainly is a good God. Amen. I, I have to tell you, I know God is a good God. And uh, I'm so pleased. I'm just proud to be here, as Minnie Pearl used to say. God is so good to me, to me all the time. I have, uh, you know, I, I, I used to love coming to Detroit. I mean, back in the back in the, the kitty days when I was a, just a mere child, you know. Uh, first time I came here to Detroit, um, I uh, I made friends with. I was with Brother Allen, but I made friends so easily here. I don't know what it was. It was I had a special feeling in my heart uh, for people in Detroit, and uh, you know, I, I kind of like to hang out because I thought it, they were all cool <laughs> you know Motown was going on I think you know this might be the place to be and so you know I kind of hung out a little bit you know uh, many of you might remember Louis the Hatter I hung out down there anybody remember him anybody remember the glass house I used to go get my shoes shined there I'd go there and get my shoes shined just to hear the shuck and jive amen <laughs> But I met some wonderful people, and uh, uh, um, I found out a, out a place. I was talking to somebody at uh, uh, there on uh, uh, City, whatever that road is down there. I forgot what it is. No, uh, we, um, uh, he, uh, his name is Gordy. He owned, uh, um, you know, Motown Records. So I had to go see that, right? And so, huh? Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, is there another? And <laughs> and so yeah, I I I went down. I had to see it. I you know I got my camera and you know during the day, Brother Allen didn't want me to do anything, so I went down there. I'm taking pictures all around, and so everybody's just real friendly. They came out and just talked up a storm, and I learned out about a place called the Rooster's Tail. <clears throat> and uh, I had never been to anything like that in my life, and. Uh, they said, yeah, yeah, come on down. And he said, I sing there, this guy was telling me. And I had no idea who he was. But uh, I said, well, you going to sing tonight? Yeah, he said, oh, what time do you go on? He said, about 11. 
And I said, I think I can get out of church just in time to get down there. And I went down there, and he became a good friend of mine later after that. His name was Levi Stubbs, and he was one of the four tops. He, be, he was a lifelong friend. When he died at age 72, uh, you know, they, they called me. And uh, the thing is, I, I just enjoyed being here. And, you know, I enjoyed the old downtown Woodward Street. Anybody remember that? I, I'm, uh, I, I, every time I go through the, uh, on the freeway uh, and see Woodward there, and now it's just an underpass, and uh, one church is still sitting up there on the hill that I used to know. But it reminds me all the time of things that were good that happened here. That were really, one. I'm not even talking about cars now. I'm talking about the goodness of people that were here. There was a lot of good people here. Another man I met, he told me a story one day. He was working in a car factory, he's Chrysler. And when he would get paid every Friday, before he could get home, he drank up all of it. He could not resist drinking. He would go out. I don't know if he was buying rounds for everybody. He said after a while he couldn't remember what he was doing at all. And, uh, you know, I asked him, well, how, how did you do that? He said, I don't know. I didn't have any control over it. It just kept getting worse and worse and, uh, and worse and worse. He'd drink up his whole paycheck <laughs> before he could get home. And his wife had a one-room apartment for her and their little girl. She paid for it because he never brought any money home. She paid for it with the washing that she did. This is a true story, by the way. And uh, uh, it, it got worse and worse and worse. The little girl kept getting not being able to go to school because they were ashamed to tell the school where she was at, not being able to buy clothes for her to go, and, and the mother, everything they had uh, uh, went into paying for the house or the room that they lived in. Few groceries, that was it. Charity from some people. And that's the way they lived. And every time that he would get a paycheck, and she said, now we got to do this and we got to do this and we got to spend, save some money for this. Uh, I don't mind you going out and drinking now. It's all right. Have a drink or two. But he couldn't stop. She said, just wanted to bring some money home. But he never did. In five years, he never brought a penny home. He took it all and drank it. And so by Sunday night, he sobered up enough to go out and have another round and then make his way to work. One day, his wife told him, said, now look, you've got to take, I, I, I've saved the money. You don't even have to spend your own money. I've saved this money. The doctor said, if our daughter does not have this medicine, she could die. And so she, the wife gave him this money. It wasn't very much. But instead of buying the medicine, he went and got drunk and was drunk for four days. And when he got back, two big things had happened. His daughter was dead. She didn't get the medicine in time. The mother had nobody to get any money from. This happened in Detroit. And they sent out a union man around to his house, to that little room. And they said, don't come back to work anymore. We don't want the likes of you here anymore. Of course, I don't blame them for that. And they sat there with their daughter laying on the kitchen table because they had nobody to do the funeral. Laying there in old rags and they didn't even put shoes on her anymore 
uh, they just used socks because they couldn't afford those little cheap shoes. And so he sat there, and, uh, you know, he cried, and, oh, this is all this is the worst day of my life and everything. She said, now listen. He was playing her. I have five dollars that I have saved. I've already called the man down on the corner for a dress to bury our daughter in. All I want you to do, please do this. Take this five dollars down there and bring the dress back. If you'll do this right now, I'll get her, I'll, I'll bathe her right now, get her all cleaned up, I'll put the new dress on her. She'll look beautiful. We'll call the preacher, the, the, the priest rather, it was, uh, she was Catholic. She said, I'll call the priest and they've made arrangements with some good knights of Columbus to come and they'll carry our baby down there to the church and they, she can have mass. And then they'll bury her. She handed him that five dollars, made him swear to God in heaven on their daughter's life, and said, now you've got to do this. And he took the five dollars out and got drunk that they didn't hear from him for six days. Five dollars gets you a lot of drinking stuff back in those days. Might still today, I don't know. And so when he finally climbed up those stairs again to that room, the door was locked. He pounded on the door. The landlord came and said, listen, she's not here. And you ain't going in because you've never paid a dime of rent since you've been here. You, you get out of the house. I'm calling the police. So now he had lost his wife his daughter, his job, his place to live, all because he drank. So he found himself homeless. This happened down on, on near Cass. Found himself homeless, standing out there begging dimes and nickels to get another shot. They threw his clothes away so he had the same clothes that he had on on his last drunk. He had nothing. Smelled like a brewery. And one night, listen, this is, this is a horrible story. It started to rain on him. And he found a bottle that somebody had dropped there on, on the side of the sidewalk in the, in the grass on the side. And he, held, he found the bottle and he held it. He was going around drinking the last swaddle out, out of bottles that he would find in order to stay high. And he found one and got two or three swigs out of it and, and somebody had thrown it away before they even thought about it, maybe. And then he sat there in the curb on Woodward Avenue and he fell over in the curb. Somebody came along and pushed him into the gutter. Water running down through the gutter right there on him. And he lifted up his eyes with no thought of a prayer to God. He was one of those men, I never asked God for anything. I won't ask God for anything now. And he looked up, here's what he saw. He saw a cross in the sky, and underneath it was two words in red letters. The cross was white around it. It glowed in the darkness and the rain. Those two words underneath it was, Jesus saves. Jesus saves. And he laid there and he said, God, I don't even believe that. 
you couldn't want anybody in heaven like me. But God did. God saved him. He crawled into that church and he made a vow to God that he was going to change his ways. Right now you can see the results of his conversion to Jesus Christ. They've done a lot to it, but it's called the Detroit Rescue Mission. His name was Mel Trotter. He's the one who founded it. And he kept it alive all those years. When I came to town, I met him one of the first trips I came to Detroit with Brother Allen. And I, I would do kind of crazy stuff because used to they had a soup kitchen. <laughs> I go down there and dip out soup to the bums. Amen. I, I didn't care about those bums. I loved Mel Trotter because he had a heart after God. I'm telling you something right now. Looking up at your most desperate hour, I pray you see the cross. There is salvation in nothing else. All of these other phony baloney copy religions, they're not going to save you. The way they get converts is to kill people. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your daughter. I'm going to re-educate her and marry her to somebody who wants a teenage girl. One of our soldiers, our fighters. You ought to read what's going on. But listen, Afghanistan is nothing new. This is the way this second biggest religion in the world has grown. From the very first time, the man came down off the mountain and said he talked to God. That's the way it does, by coercion. It's by threat of the sword. It's by someone wanting to beat you up if you don't believe what they believe. Someone wanting to rape your teenage daughter. And woe unto you if you've got a gay son or a gay daughter. They'll throw them off a rooftop. Because their prophet told him to. We're at, and you, you moddy coddlers, is that a good word? You walk around and let your sons and daughters get involved in that junk, thinking it's your culture. Somebody told me I was just racist because I didn't like people from Afghanistan. And I said, look, I have met Pashtuns. I have met Pashtuns at the airport in Kabul. They're whiter than I am. <laughs> There's, how can I be prejudiced then? It's not prejudice against the people. God knows we have to love everybody. But I am prejudiced against this system that infiltrates people's minds. And it's a lie of the devil. And they're believing a lie. And they'll be damned. Keep your sons and daughters away from them. They're trying to destroy you. But I know something. Amen. Mel Trotter looked up and saw the cross. I didn't, get, I didn't see the cross the night that I got saved, but I was there because of the cross. I had no vision. I didn't see anything great. Dr. King and I, when we walked past that same church that was down here when he was here and we walked up Woodward Avenue, he said, do you know the story about Mel Trotter? And I said, yes, I do. He knew it. He knew what had happened there. You and I, child of God, have to know that I am glad for the cross. I am glad for the cross where Jesus died. I am glad for the cross where he suffered, bled, and died. If it had not been for the cross, my soul would be lost. I'm glad for the cross where Jesus died. I don't know who wrote that, but they had to write words down. You and I, we, we let too many little foolish things come into our life. Oh, just go, yeah, just a drink. It, it, that don't matter. Be sociable. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to say this. There's some people can handle booze and there's some people who cannot. 
For somebody, some people can have a beer and go home and, and, uh, and watch TV without one. And there's some people who cannot. There's some people who have a drink and you can't stop them after that. Yeah, and one, one leads to another. And uh, uh, they, can't, they can't help themselves. There is a demon of drink. There is a demon, a demon that will compel you to keep on doing that. You'll develop an urge inside you and you'll find your friends. I'm a woe unto you if the only friends you have are the ones you find when you're sharing a bottle. Amen. I grew up with moonshiners. I know what I'm talking about. My family was moonshiners. But I'm telling you right now, the preaching, when I start preaching this way about the cross of Christ, there are people saying, why do you keep on harping on the same thing? I'm telling you right now, there ain't no other thing to harp on. I'm glad for the cross where Jesus died. Matter of fact, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. But to us who believe... It's the power of God. You want to get some more power of God? Amen. <laughs> go to the cross. <laughs> you want to get God moving for you? Go to the cross. Kneel at the cross. He will meet you there. You can find Paul writing this in 1 Corinthians, uh, the, uh, the first chapter. For Christ sent me not to baptize. I know some of you get mad at me all the time. Well, you haven't had a baptismal service since I don't know when. How are you going to go to heaven if you don't get baptized? I ain't worried about the water. I'm worried about the spirit. You need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'll dunk you under the water anytime you want to go. But it won't get you into heaven. But if I get you full of the Holy Ghost, something's going to change and happen in your life. I want you filled with the Spirit. If you're filled with the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Yeah. Scripture talking here. Come on, say amen. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of men's words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He's saying, if I came out here and I started spouting off Harvard and Yale and what I learned in Bible college and uh, listen to me how smart I am, that's wisdom of men's words. That's not important. I don't care how smart you are. You can be a dummy if you know how to call on Jesus. I said, you can be a dummy if you know how to call on the Lord. If you can call on Jesus right now, you'll get an answer. Amen. I don't have to <laughs> quote some writer that I don't even care about. You don't know who it is. I, I see people carrying these books around like carrying a book is going to make you smart. Well, I've got Kenneth Hagin's book here. I, 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 I got great faith. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin had faith enough to write a book. That don't mean you got it because you bought it. Can anybody say amen? amen? Listen to this. For the preaching, verse 18, of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. When I preach the cross, demons tremble. Hell backs up. It shuts the mouths of lions. It crunches the violence of fire. It makes demons run from me. Amen. You have all of these folks nowadays, they want to say things like, oh, if you wear a cross, it, me it means you must be Catholic. You're not even believing in Jesus. Jesus ain't on the cross. Hello, dummy. Don't you think we know that? I know Jesus isn't about that big on a cross. Amen. I know that. But I'm going to tell you, I got a cross around my neck I've had for 30-some years around my neck since a famous pope gave it to me. I don't wear it because of him. 
I wear it because everybody said, what I just got through telling you. Don't show a cross. They told me this in, in the Holy Land. Don't go into some neighborhoods wearing a cross because it offends people. I said, what neighborhood is that? So I got my cross. I, I went out and got me a nice chain. Amen. I put my cross on there and I said, hey, look at this. Hey, look me over. Hallelujah. The thing is, child of God, we have to be bold for Jesus Christ and bold for the cross. Because it, the cross is the power of God and the cross is what saves me. Some of you thinking your own righteousness has gotten you where you are. Beg your pardon. Not so. Not true. I didn't get here because I'm righteous. I got here because I have faith in Jesus. Somebody shout amen. It's not because of my good works that I have anything. It's because I have a good Jesus. That's why I have something. The father gave his life. Hallelujah. And he died on the cross. And he came back to life again. And when he came out of that grave, you know, you know what was happening? I got this picture in my mind. You know, uh, if you ever read uh, 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 Dante's Inferno, or uh, uh, where he, he has all these pictures done by Salvador Dali <laughs> down here with all these demons jumping up in, in the flames of hell and people down there just groaning and moaning and well, I got this picture in my mind that on the day that Jesus died on the cross, that they all stopped and they all started having a big time. Did you hear that? We've won. The devil was saying, I've won. I beat him. I did it. Finally, I did it. We have beat him. But they misunderstood Jesus on the cross. They thought he said, I'm finished. He didn't say, he, he didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. Everything I came to do, I have done. I have been faithful unto death. I believe in God the Father. And I, hallelujah. This is what does it. Hallelujah. So I know immediately it's not who I am. It's who he is. It's not what I do. It's what he's done at Calvary. It's all because of Jesus. It ain't all because of me. These lying low down pig sty preachers got to tell you it's all about you. What do you think the devil's going to tell you? He's selling you a bad car. He ain't going <laughs> to ain't going to tell you about the rods knocking. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's going to tell you, "Oh, you've got such good taste and look at its fine Corinthian leather." <laughs> <laughs> oh, not everybody has a taste like you do. <laughs> not everybody's as smart as you. What do you think the devil's going to come in and say, you taste this, you'll die? And yet that's what exactly the devil does. It is the power of God. You need to write down 1 Corinthians 1.18. It is the power of God. It is the power of God. Not the foolishness of preaching is the power of God, but it is what we say that saves people. It's not the enticing words of men's wisdom that saves you. You know, I, I've heard some of the greatest preachers in, in the land in my lifetime in the last hundred years. <laughs> well, how many... However many years it was, I forget. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you there. Thank God I dropped my feet. <laughs> I've heard some great preachers, and they're eloquent. I've got to tell you, somebody said, oh, you sound like, no, I don't sound like them. I couldn't possibly sound. Somebody said one day, you write just like Robert G. Lee. And I said, i got to tell you right now, I can't even write two words together that sound like him. I used to drive 200 miles out of the way to go be in his church service on Sunday morning because the man was eloquent, and it wasn't no put-on stuff. I mean, he could get up, and he was talking from his heart. You know, <laughs> you know like I'd be talking about green beans and cornbread. Hallelujah. 
he could talk this stuff from his heart. And it was convincing. And uh, 25 years ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury was such a man who had such an intellect that he could get up and he could talk. And his, his words were such, such power. And, uh, I mean, you could just feel uh, this guy knows what he's talking about. But I want to tell you right now, that will not save you. I, I, I was out at the Word Network the other day, and uh, um, uh, Kevin Coles, he was an a, a, a engineer out there, he said, hey, listen to this. And you know who it was on the air at that time? It was T.D. Jakes. That man can talk. Amen. I mean, he can talk up a storm. He can talk behind my back anytime he wants to. Hallelujah. <laughs> but the thing is, those enticing words will not save you. It's the cross that saves you. It's your faith in Jesus Christ. It's your faith in the cross. And I got to tell you, I, <laughs> there's few people I love to listen to, but he's one of them. But it ain't going to save me. Amen. Something on the inside of you has to do that. It has to be the Spirit of God that moves inside of us that is our salvation when we believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I wonder how long sermons would be on Sunday morning if that's all they did. I don't know nothing except about Jesus Christ. Amen. What would people do? I don't, I'm not going to tell you anything except what I know about Jesus. Well, some of them be through in about five minutes because they don't know nothing about Jesus. They spend hours reading books so they can come up with something else to say. I got news for them right now. If you get in on your knees and you believe in the cross of Jesus Christ, if you hold on to that, if you embrace it, if you believe in what Jesus did on Calvary, your life will change. You'll never be short of a great word of compliment about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What do you know about Jesus? Amen. I know. Yeah, that, that, that's a song. I said, you got any more verses to that? <laughs> yeah, we know he's all right, but what else? Yeah, God is a good God. Yes, he is. Amen. I know we got to stay in the, the iambic pentameter, but holy mackerel. <laughs> Tell me not what you know about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. What do you know about Jesus. Just telling me he's all right, that ain't going to cut it with me. Sit down and tell me what you know about Jesus. That's what Mel Trotter did with me one day. He said, I want you to sit down. I want to tell you what I know about Jesus. Whoo! Hallelujah. Well, it changed me inside. It changed me to know that somebody had come from the gutter and I'm telling you about this power of the cross. It'll make the drunkard push his wine bottle away. It'll make the coke addict throw away his pipe. Hallelujah. It'll make an impure woman pure again. And it'll make a worthless man of value again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I remember Hank Williams wrote a song. And it started out, I wandered so aimless." My life filled with sin because I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. This is your message here today. Let him in. Open the door. I stand at the door and knock. Didn't he say it? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Who's going to open up and let me come in? Well, we see people all the day, hallelujah, that have not let Jesus come in. I want to find somebody who has let Jesus come in. <laughs> I used to tease Brother Shambach all the time. Or, yeah, <laughs> Brother Shadrach, Brother Shambach, amen, all the time. Because he, he loved to sing this song. Uh, uh, when, since Jesus came into my heart, and I listened to him one night as he's leading song service. And I said, 
you know, I never knew you was saying that before. Here's the song says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. You know what he was saying and nobody knew it? What a wonderful change in my wife has been wrought. <laughs> but he only did that for his wife, Winnie, so she, <laughs> she didn't pay attention to him, I guess. The truth is, child of God, you and I <laughs> need to understand something. It's not what God does for somebody else. Every once in a while, it's got to be what God does for you and what you do for God. God bless them all. God bless the child got his own. I ain't got any of it, but God bless the child that's got his own. That means he ain't going to come to me and ask me for my stuff. That's what you ask Billy Holiday. She, that's what she said it meant. The truth is, you and I have to get to a place where we got our own. Somebody called me on the telephone and said, Brother Ross, uh, do you pray for the sick there? And I said, yeah. Uh, when's your next healing service? I said, Sunday morning. Oh, you got a healer there? Yes. Well, what's his name? I said, his name is Jesus. She said, no, no, no. Uh, don't you have famous evangelists there? I said, you come on Sunday morning. Well, when is your next evangelist coming? I said, well, I'll send you a note in the mail. They only want to come when they've got somebody here, you know, pulling out short legs and telling you who you are. Hallelujah. There are people exactly like that. They only come for blessing. And if they, you don't tickle their little innards just the way they like it, they won't come back. Well, I'm not a tickle your innards kind of guy. What I believe is in the word of God. And if the word don't make you happy, if the cross don't make you happy, if the Holy Ghost don't make you happy, if the joy of the Lord doesn't make you happy, hallelujah, I don't know how to help you. You see, out of 400 people in these last revivals we had, you see, oh, they, well, I'm telling you something now, right now, child of God. Your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. I want you to start thinking different. Don't think, he's got power. Oh, I feel the power. He's got power. I want you to start saying, I got power. Point right here at yourself and say, I got power. I am called. I am anointed. I am saved. I am God sent to this world. Oh, hallelujah. I have God life living on the inside of me. I have God's Holy Ghost power moving down in my soul. In him I move. In him I breathe. In him I have my being. When I walk, Jesus walks. And when I pray, Jesus prays. And when I call on God, I know I'm going to get an answer because it's God that I call on and God is a prayer answering God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't take no no's for another. Don't get these answers going out here. Throw all your books about faith away and read the Bible. If you got one of mine, throw it away too. I only wrote it from one of my sermons. Hey Amen. I wrote it so you'd buy it. You ain't been buying it. I ain't even going to print it no more. <laughs> Show you how I feel about it. You got the Bible. And you know more than that. You want a man of God? You want a woman of God? You want a man who can prophesy? You want a woman who is anointed by the Holy Ghost? Get on your knees in the morning and then go look in the mirror. <laughs> Hallelujah. Instead of running around saying, I need a miracle, you ought to stand up and say, I am a miracle. I'm the miracle of God that God sent to this world. I'm an ambassador from a far country. Hallelujah. I'm here on a mission for God. They closed the embassy down there in Kabul. And I'm going to tell you right now, 
<laughs> those, those patriotic people that work for America in the embassy, they were out of there and left everything. Well, I'm an ambassador to a far country, and the devil's going to have a lot of hell to get rid of me. Amen. Amen. I ain't moving. I ain't giving up. I ain't going to quit. I ain't leaving. I ain't retiring. Oh, no, wait, wait a minute. I got to change that. You know, I did retire. I'd retired when I was 61 because I figured it out that the longer I live, the more money I get, even if it's a lesser amount. Amen. <laughs> they don't want to give you that money. <laughs> Come on, say amen. <laughs> but they paying me. <laughs> and they interrupt the flow of that cash. I'm going to Washington, D.C. to see somebody. Amen. Come on, say amen. <laughs> you and I are the children of God. We've got to get a light heart about this because we possess all things. All things become, are of God, little children, and God owns the cattle on a thousand hill. He owns the gold underneath those hills and the oil on the flat levels. God owns it all. The Bible said he owes all good in his hand. He openeth his hand. It is filled with good. I trust in the Lord. I pray you do too. Get your mind on God here today, and God is going to make a way in your life. If you dare, join hands with somebody. <laughs> or join fists with some, somebody. <laughs> or just touch somebody. Amen. 